Buenos días a todos. Uh, la presentación sería sobre cómo construir uh, un uh, sistema de archivos en Python. Uh, well, don't worry, I'm going to talk in English. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought a lot. Uh, our talk. <laughs> Thank you. Our talk will be uh, EFS, and we'll share some advice, some experiences in how can you actually build a file system in Python. I'm Emmanuel, uh, and I'm a software engineer at Presslabs. Hi, I'm Vlad, and I'm also a software engineer at Presslabs. Before we get to the details of the file system, uh, I would like to introduce our company a bit so we get uh, a picture of what we do and the problems that we encounter. Uh, we are a Romanian-based startup, and we do WordPress hosting dedicated for publishers. Uh, our main goals are performance, reliability, and humanity. And as you can see on the uh, low, uh, slide, uh, low part of the slide, we encountered interesting numbers along the years. We had 45 million uh, page views on a single site during the day. We also had 6 million page views on a single site in a single hour. In our busiest month, uh, totally summed, we had 2.2 billion page views. And in the past 12 months, we only had 0 0.00006 outage, including the maintenance time. Okay, so this is not more. And this neither. <laughs> no. Yeah. And we didn't even begin the demo, so. Apologize for this. This was not planned at all. Yeah, like we are on call, both of us. So this is a, an emergency entry. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Problem solved. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this was not planned, but it, it turns out well. Uh, we as you can it. imagine, the business is far from perfect, <laughs> and one of the problems that we encountered along the years was the conflict between the publishers, namely the site owners, and their developers. So usually the workflow works like this. Uh, someone has a website and a developer, and the developer uh, writes the code, everyone is happy, until the publisher, namely the site owner, uh, tries to change things. And they try to change it even though they don't have the uh, technical know-how. So this is it. We have chaos. Uh, they break the site. We don't know who changed what. Uh, the, the publisher starts uh, start blaming us. The developers start blaming their publishers and blaming us. So yeah, we have a big pile of chaos. So we thought really hard, how can we fix this problem? And after some thinking, we came up with GitFS. But what is GitFS actually? GitFS is a self-versioning file system based on Git. And once you mount it, you can, usually, you can use it just like a normal file system. But behind the curtains, it will do automatically the versioning part. So from a functional point of view, what it does, it, take the, it, it takes this complicated tree structure, which is not really uh, human readable, and it transforms it into this. As you can see, we have the root uh, folder, which contains two main folders, current and history. In the current folder, we have the state of the repository at the uh, latest moment. So in the current folder, you, you, will, f you will find the newest uh, 
content. In the history folder, uh, we have a folder for each commit. So basically, we take each commit, we uh, take the content from the Git objects, and we display it in a humanly readable way. And in the current folder, you can write, you can change uh, the content, you can view the content. And in the history folder, you can only see the content of the commits. So uh, yeah, this is it, simple, right? Now uh, let's do a demo, and hopefully it will work as planned. OK. Um, we have here the remote uh, repository. I'm not using the network, hopefully, this time. And uh, here we have the de developer clones of the, the remote uh, repository. And now we are going to mount this file system in mount point. It's, uh, it's very easy. You just pass the remote uh, URL, pass the mount point, some parameters, like local repo path, and some timeouts. OK. Now, in one point, you're going to see that awesome structure with current and history. In current, you'll have the current state of the repository, which is just, some, just a file. And in uh, history, you're going to see a very nice three a very nice history of that repository grouped by each uh, commit. Now let's go to the developer side and uh, write some text. Like put 42 in readme. We commit them. and just push it. Now, if we go to the GitFS, uh, GitFS mount point in current and open that file, we're going to see, see the 42 um, content uh, text. And in history, the last commit is now. And Pretty much that's it. In history, it's a bit, a little bit special. You cannot do any write operation uh, because it's only, it's read only. Neither in the root, um, the root code, uh, directory. Okay. Thanks a lot. So yeah, it worked. As you can see, it's easy as one to three. It was built entirely in Python. It's open source, so if you find this project interesting, we welcome you to contribute, change it, adapt it to your needs, and maybe we can grow it further from this point on. But how was it actually made? Well, since neither of us had previous experience in building file systems, we started with some research. We jotted some requirements, and after analyzing these requirements, we defined two problems. First of all, how can we handle the Git objects in a very efficient manner, both time-wise and memory-wise? And second of all, how can we implement the files, uh, file system operations? Again, very efficient. For solving the uh, Git objects management problem, we use PyG2. PyG2 is a wrapper on top of libg2, uh, libg2 being a library written in C which handles the Git objects directly. So no command line, no time waste. wasted. For implementing the operation, uh, the file system operations, we use FusePy, which again is a wrapper on top of the uh, Fuse C library. And using FusePy, you'll see we have a very elegant way of implementing the file system operations. And now I'm going to let Vlad uh, tell you more details about the intricacies of how GitFS works. Vlad? Thank you. OK, to simplify a little bit the, our job, we introduce a concept called views. A views basically is just a class that implements some syscalls that do some specific logic. 
For example, for each directory, we added, we created a view for current directory, the current view for history, the history view, so on and so forth. Between the actual syscall and those views, we introduced a router. And uh, based on some regular expression, when the open, for example, syscall is going to be passed to the router, that router is going to route the syscall to the specific view and execute the proper logic. It's pretty obvious, Django does it, everybody does it. Now, uh, if, if I'm going to open a file from nine months ago, for example, that I'm going to do an open syscall. That open syscall is going to be passed to the router. Router will decide that I need the commit view to do that open. And I will instantiate a new uh, commit view, execute the open, and return the file descriptor. This is uh, our very easy and uh, useful uh, diagram view views. We have a main view called view which inherit from logging, mixing, and operations from uh, views. That view is going to be inherited by read-only view and pass-through view. The read-only view is going to be inherited by history, commit, and index view, because as you can uh, saw earlier, you cannot change the past. So uh, yeah, the current view is going to implement the pass-through view. Uh, basically, the current directory is just a pass-through view with some additional uh, magic for the for the right operation. Okay, uh, as you can encounter in real life, if you are doing a lot of pushing, pulling commits and stuff like that, you get a lot of conflicts eventually. And uh, we did the same. We implemented in our file system a simple push-pull mechanism. And uh, in order to solve those conflicts, we choose to implement a strategy called always accept mine. Uh, because for us is one of the safest strategy, but you, in PyGit 2 you don't have this option, so you need to implement uh, by hand your own uh, strategy. Also, the strategy mechanism is pluggable. If you want to implement or use another strategy, just specify that at the one point. Uh, okay, let's simulate the conflict. We have a branch, let's call master, with the commit one, two, and three. And on the remote, the developer pushes commit four, five, and six. And our file system on local wrote the commit seven and eight. In order to always accept the local changes, what we need to do is to get all those seven and eight commits and push them after the commits four, five, and six. First of all, we split those local and remote um, branches in merging remote and merging local branch. We easily can find after that that the three commit, the third commit is the um, last common commit. And after that, we can find the seven and eight are the local changes, changes and local commits that needs to be uh, appended to the merging remote. After that, we just append seven and eight to the merging remote and rename the merging remote branch to the local branch. And that's, that's how we, we solve the um, conflicts. Now, we have a pretty stable file system. We have uh, a basic pull-push mechanism. Um, we solve the conflicts. But now let's see how it can behave in the real world. For that, we need a really big repository. And we choose WordPress, which has like 70,000 commits. And to do a simple listing on the history view, it took 34 minutes, which is not fun. So uh, as you can imagine, after some prof profiling, we uh, find our bottlenecks, and we can cache everything. So uh, uh, we implemented three layers of cache. The first layer on the bottom, we cache all the Git objects. At the, when we mount the repository at mount point, we read all those Git objects and we store them in the cache, in the memory. After that, and also invalidate on each new, new commit the, the, that cache. After that, we saw that the router uh, just created new, a lot of new views and he didn't reuse them. Each time you, do, uh, you wanted to read a new file, he will just create a new view and do the same open and read uh, uh, read operations. For that, we implemented a simple all-view cache for all the views, 
And uh, in the end, we uh, implemented a git ignore cache, and for now we don't support some module. We did that because uh, each time you wanted to write to a file, uh, you needed to check if, okay, in that path where I want to write is in git ignore or in git some module, no. So basically what we did, we just put all the git ignore and git some module content in a big, uh, in memory and invalidate that uh, cache on each new commit. After that, after we implement all those three layers of cache, we managed to do the actual history uh, listing on the WordPress repository in three seconds. So from 34 mi minutes to three seconds is a big improvement. Okay, now for the last part, we needed a smarter upstream synchronization mechanism. We just, doing just pull, push, and merge is not enough because for example, you don't want, if you have a big archive and you just unzip it, um, you don't want to have 1,000 files, you, you don't want to have 1,000 commits for each file. You just want to have one commit saying, okay, I just wrote 300 or 1,000 files to the disk. In order to obtain such things, we had uh, four more components, main components. We have, first, we have the few threads, which we don't have control on them, I don't know how many fuse threads fuse will gonna spawn for me or stuff like that. Basically those are the current history views and um, other views. We have a git uh, a commit queue and a sync worker. We use the commit queue to uh, communicate between the fuse threads and the sync worker. The sync worker is gonna do all the syncing, the merging, pull, pushing stuff. And uh, also we have the fetch worker, which is just gonna fetch the certain timeout from the remote. The fet fetching worker has a special mode called idle mode. For example, if you don't do, you don't have any activities on your file system for more than a timeout, let's say a day, then it's go to that, uh, it's entered that idle mode, and in idle mode, the timing, the time between fetches increase. So, for example, if you don't have any activities on your repository or on your file system for more than one day, it's gonna fetch only once per week or once per month or so on. We do that to save some resources. Okay, now if we have, if our few threads are uh, done writing some files, after that uh, some commit jobs are gonna be put to the commit queue, and that job, those jobs are gonna be consumed by the sync worker. The sync worker is gonna batch those jobs and create only one commit, and as soon as the commit is created, he wants to push them to the upstream. In order to do that, first we need to merge those um, commits. In order to merge, we need a clean staging area. To get a clean staging area, we have to lock all the writes and wait until all the writes from the fuse threads are done. We notify the fuse threads, okay, now I need to merge and push, so please don't do any write operation. And also the fetch worker, okay, please stop. I'm okay, I'm going to sync the changes. After the sync process is done and all the changes are up to the upstream, you just, the sync worker is just notifying the few threads and the uh, fetch worker that is okay, you can now resume your work. The concurrency everywhere. Uh, now for the final remark, I will, remarks, I will let Manu to say some final words. Thank you, Rod. Uh, if you wanna use GitFS, you can simply install it. We have, uh, we have created an Ubuntu package and some folks from the community also created one for Fedora and Arch. You also uh, have one for OSX, so if you're a Mac user, you can uh, use GitFS. Okay, and uh, now we want to leave you with some takeaways that uh, we hope will be beneficial for you. First and foremost, um, you can actually create a file system in Python and use it. 
you can see we did it. We, are, we have been using it for almost a year now. And we had uh, no problems related to the technologies we used. Lot of, lots of folks saw, said, OK, you should write it in C and, or uh, something more fast. But we did it, and as you saw, it works great. Writing a fuse file system at first is uh, pretty straightforward. You have to implement some operations, and you're done. But to get the data model right and the operations associated with it, that model sometimes can be tricky. Again, you saw we had some problems with concurrency. This is the actual model that Vlad spoke about. As you can imagine, it was not the first one that we came up with. And we had lots of problems, and we did a lot of re refinements to get here. So this is a word of caution. If some, sometime in the future you plan to write a file system, you should think really hard about the model. And last but not least, uh, we enjoy working with new shiny tools, programming language. After all, this is a conference about programming language. Um, but sometime, sometimes it's good to not forget that our main purpose is making people's life easier. And we should sometimes focus on creating tools that allow non-technical people uh, to get access to uh, powerful systems. So some, someone who is not technical could use Git, for example. That's, in our opinion, something pretty awesome. You can find the project here. And we are expecting you. If you think this project is interesting, we are eager uh, to get more contributors. And as we said, to grow it further. It has a lot of use cases that are not yet implemented, but could be. Now, if you have any questions, doubts, please ask. Hello. Uh, Hi. Can you explain how this helped you solve the, the first problem that you described with JavaScript? Yeah. How is it put to the real world uh, work? Uh, I will answer. Um, we have basically our clients use SFTP, and they are pretty much familiar with SFTP. So we just mount that this file system on a SFTP uh, server, and they can use SFTP, but instead, in the background, they are using Git file system, this Git file system, and their developers can now use Git, because usually the developers know how to use Git, but the problem is with the publishers. So in case there's a JavaScript error, you go back to a previous version, or what do you do? Uh, yeah, you can do that, but it's not automatically. You need to go and do a copy from the history, uh, from the last um, checkpoint of the repository or the last commit, and then copy the entire directory there. So I have a question. Great work. Hello. Congratulations. Hello. So yeah, oh, I'm okay. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is a way to limit the number of revisions in the history of uh, in Git FS so that you cannot, I mean, if you are doing a lot of updates, your storage keeps on certain limits and not grow for, uh, uh, for, for too long? Right now, no, but you can do some tricks here. For example, you can uh, specify that sync timeout a little bit like to have to do the sync. Basically, that sync timeout somehow is related to how often I do the commit. And for example, I can batch an entire hour of uh, changes and in only one commit. And uh, you can limit that way. But you don't have a hard limit, say, OK, I, you can do only 1,000 um, revisions or something like that. Hello. Thanks. Feels like a pretty neat tool. I have actually two short questions. First one, like you shown the Git rebase thingy was 
was it like Gitra base? I mean, was it slide like four, five, six, and seven, eight commits? Yeah, the merging part? Uh, yeah, yeah. So my question is if you can reuse some parts of Git actually, or you had to implement it from scratch? Well, um, the, we don't use any Git, uh, we don't use the Git command line tool. So basically, we just uh, did it by hand, and we commit, we merge. Uh, here, for example, when we paste the seven and eight commit, we needed to merge manually each, uh, okay. each commit. Right. And the second short one, like, uh, do you profit from a tree structure or file system? Because it's basically a tree. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, can you repeat a little bit the other question? Because I don't know. Uh, do you profit from a natural tree structure from a file system itself? Not that much right now. Thanks for your talk. Um, you. you were saying you are caching a lot of stuff from the Git repository. Yep. So I was wondering, is your memory consumption going up when your Git repository gets really big? Uh, yeah, but it's not uh, linear or expansionally. Because, for example, for WordPress repository, it took only 200 megabytes, I think, 200 or 300 for a very, very, very big repository. Uh, usually in production, we have only like 60 megabytes per repository, so it's pretty, for us, it's pretty low, but yeah, it can get a little bit higher. <laughs> Even though libgit2 is really, really efficient in, in, that, in that way. And you can tweak a little bit the cache, so for example, the, the views cache, you can tweak and say, I, you, you need to stop at that, that memory size. Um, how do you do a specific revert? How do you find that? Yeah, for now you don't have, you, 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 it's pretty hard to model that in a file system because you, for example, you need a special file and when you open that file to do a revert or when I'm writing, you, you can get like a meta file with metadata and say, okay, please revert to that commit, but for now, you only can do that manually, going to the history commit, and uh, just move all the commits, all the, the files, or just the file that you are interested in. But that's a pretty, pretty cool features, feature. Thank um, thanks. Um, do you have a problem with uh, big binary data, like uh, images, maybe? Yeah, we don't actually support that, and we have <laughs> we have a limit on how much you can write, and this is all tweakable from the from the, from the options. And second question about do you know about GitHub tweak uh, for the big files? Uh, like GitHub tries to move its uh, big files from the Git system to another file system, and yeah. keep a link. Do you GitFS keep these links too? Yeah, for now, no. Oh. And I don't think we are going to to implement that. What is a good question, and we can can debate on that because uh, that's a lot of implication to do that. Okay, thank you for great work. Thank you. Um, instead of using the repository as a backing for a file system, is it possible to use the file system as a view on an already existing repository? So it might just give you a nice way of using a standard file browser and tools to just look through the history of a, a Git repository you already got? Yeah, for now, no, because what it does is just clone that repository, but that's a nice idea. That's a, that's a nice idea. Usually don't work this way, but it could, yeah, you can do that. For now, I know, I know that you cannot push on the local repository, you need to be a bad repository to do the actual push, but maybe we, we can change it a little bit so it can be just a view of your of your repository. Thank you. No more questions. Okay, well thank you. Thank you. Thank you.